Mooney aircraft are known for speed and efficiency. Their smooth, laminar flow wing, distinctive tail, and low stance on the ground distinguish Moonies from other aircraft. It's almost inconceivable to imagine that this sports car of the sky was born from a tiny single seater. The Mooney Might provided the foundation for everything Mooney ever built. Let's take a quick glance at the man behind the Mooney Might and understand his vision behind the design. Al Mooney was born in Denver and cut his teeth as an engineer for several companies in the 1920s. During his time working for others, Al was restless and felt the designs of the day were slow and inefficient, including the ones for the companies he worked for. While working for Alexander Aircraft, he designed the Bullet, one of the first production aircraft with a retractable gear. And while the aircraft was a commercial flop, it set the stage for everything Mooney strived for with his next designs. He then tried to market his own design, the Mooney A1, but the Great Depression hit and it too went nowhere. Mooney was then hired as chief executive for Culver Aircraft and designed the Dart and Cadet two-seaters, which were tiny but fast designs that already bore the Mooney hallmarks. High speed, on minimal power, and a highly efficient airframe. When World War II broke out, all manufacturers directed their production at military aircraft, including Culver. The cadet was used as the basis for the PQ-14, an optionally manned drone that featured a tricycle landing gear. This aircraft was a direct ancestor to the Mooney Might, which was to come a few years later. As soon as the war ended, Al Mooney and his brother Arthur formed Mooney Aircraft with the goal of producing an aircraft that, that would fill every fighter pilot's desires. Fighter-like agility, simple to operate, practical, and most importantly, wouldn't break the bank. Named the M18 Might, the tiny aircraft checked off all those boxes and then some. One of Al Mooney's visions with the Might was an aircraft that could be mass produced and used as a daily transport for those who required long commutes to work. In essence, a plane for the masses. While these visions of mass production weren't exactly fulfilled, the Might was immediately well received by both new and experienced pilots. The Might was certainly a sexy aircraft to look at and fun to fly, but the real genius of the Might lies in the details. Al Mooney's goal was to extract the most performance out of minimal power, and in order to achieve this, the tiny mite featured laminar flow wings, the same type of wing found on the P-51 Mustang. Laminar flow wings were a novelty in the 1940s. Most manufacturers chose not to use them as they made the aircraft much trickier to handle at low speeds. Knowing that laminar flow wings are not conducive to good handling at slow speeds, Al Mooney incorporated a standard airfoil in the outer section of the wing together with the ailerons and in the process creating the first hybrid laminar flow wing aircraft in history. To improve performance on the low end of the speed envelope even further, the might included flaps as well. All to the benefit of low time and high time pilots. The might could now easily fly out of dirt or grass runways, making it very appealing to pilots at small airports. With such a clean wing and streamlined fuselage, they also tended to glide very well, which could spell trouble on an approach, especially on shorter runways. The retractable gears, when extended, doubled as spoilers and helped tame the smooth Mooney Might on approaches. What really set the Mooney Might apart was a tail that seemed to point in the opposite direction of all other aircraft. In reality, only the trailing edge is forward swept, lending it the backwards look Moonies are famous for. So why did Al Mooney design it this way? While there isn't one single definitive answer, the consensus stands that this design added stability as the forward tilting rudder would be fully upright when at high angles of attack, and thus placing it almost directly into the oncoming airflow. And if that's truly the case, we can tip our hat yet again to the genius of Al Mooney. And yet, Another subtle feature lies in this tail. The tail has no trim tabs. Instead, the whole tail pivots while trimming. 
This is yet another quirky but ingenious design feature that's been carried through every model of Mooney till this day. In fact, Al Mooney built this all moving tail feature into the Lockheed Jetstar many years later. While small aircraft were not exactly rare in the post-war era, none of them had retractable gear, which made perfect sense. Typically the mechanisms required for such systems are complex and heavy, relying on hydraulics, pneumatic tubing, plus compressors and actuators. Not so with the mite. A long lever called the Johnson bar was placed on the floor and with one strong yank from the pilot would safely retract all three gears via push rods. It is said that it was easy to tell a first time mite pilot as the aircraft would wag all over the place on climb as the pilot struggled to lift the gear up while flying the aircraft. But practice makes perfect. Many pilots have experienced the dreaded gear up landing a common event that still happens quite frequently till this day. In the event a forgetful mite pilot would leave the gear up before landing, a mechanical lever protruding from the cockpit would activate at lower power settings. Wagging back and forth, this device was impossible to ignore. As soon as the pilot released the Johnson bar and lowered the gear, the device would deactivate. It said Al incorporated this feature after embarrassing himself with the gear up landing. Many of the mites included a plexiglass window on the cockpit floor, letting pilots know the gear was properly retracted. In the event a pilot was unable to lock the Johnson bar in place, they were advised to conduct a belly landing. Mooney assured owners that with a thorough inspection, the very strong fuselage would likely be airworthy to fly again. And speaking of landing gears, here we see another stroke of genius by Al Mooney. In order to keep costs low and trouble free, Shock absorbers consisted of simple rubber donuts, which were shockingly easier to maintain versus typical landing gears. The short, stubby landing gear with rubber donuts can still be found on most Mooney models. The original Mooney tires came from a wheelbarrow, another cost-cutting measure. Furthering the concept of safety and simplicity, pilots didn't have to retrim the aircraft while deploying flaps. The flap and trim mechanisms were interconnected thus lowering pilot workload during approaches. This was branded as the safe trim system and patent by Mooney. In offering a truly affordable plane, Al Mooney had to think outside the box when picking the costliest component of the aircraft, the engine. While automotive power plants are commonplace in the home built world today, it was nearly unheard of in the late 40s. And furthering the risk, Mooney chose a highly con unconventional engine a Crosley inline four, one of the first engines with an overhead cam. In addition to being tiny, it was built out of sheet metal and therefore very light. With only 44 cubic inches, it produced 25 horsepower at 7,000 RPM and thus required a belt drive to turn the propeller. The first 10 mites were delivered with Crosleys, however it was soon found out that they were very unreliable and had a tendency to crack their cases. As small as the Mooney mites were, pilots also felt they were quite underpowered with the Crosley. Mooney ferried all 10 mites back to the factory and had them upgraded at no cost to Lycoming O145s with 65 horsepower. This upgrade meant that the very light Mooney, originally designed for only 25 horsepower, was now powered by an engine with nearly three times the power. As a result, top speed increased from 100 miles per hour to 138 and rate of climb was about 1000 feet per minute. The Mooney Mite truly became a pocket fighter, exactly as Al intended. At this stage of development, the little Mooney was nearly perfect. Pilots raved about how well balanced the Mite was, very responsive and yet docile at low speeds and landings. As small and cramped as the cockpit was, most pilots were having so much fun they'd forget about the size. True to the spirit of keeping the Mooney ultra light, they did not have an electrical system nor starter. So engine starts consisted of the pilots hand propping the mite while standing in front of the wing. In an early article, one pilot raved about the mite. When you fly this little thing, you don't feel like a pilot. 
You feel like a goddamn bird. Mooney's rolled out of the factory costing only $2,000 and at the time were the cheapest production aircraft available. With only 65 horsepower, the nimble Mike could zip along at 125 miles per hour while sipping only 4 gallons of fuel. An incredible accomplishment in efficiency even for today. To help promote the Mike and celebrate his 25 years as an aircraft designer, Al decided to break a long distance record for its category. Packing the plane with 45 gallons of fuel, Al Mooney flew the Mite from Texas to North Dakota, a total distance of 1,312 miles. And yet, after all this, Mooney was losing money on the Mite. Al's vision of mass production did not materialize and the handcrafted wooden airframe was costly to build. Facing bankruptcy, they halted production moved the factory to Carryville, Texas, where all remaining Mooney aircraft were built until the company went bankrupt. Lycoming stopped producing the O-145, so it was replaced with the 65 horsepower Continental A-65, essentially the same engine that powered the Piper Cub. Performance, range, and cockpit size increased over time, and so did price. Eventually, the Mite was costing $4,000, double what it initially sold at, and Mooney was bleeding money more than ever. The Mite was used as the foundation for the M20, a four-place model that rolled out in the mid-50s. The M20 boasted the same efficiency and all the innovative features pioneered on the Mite, but packaged as a four-seater with much improved payload and capabilities. The writing was on the wall for the Mite, and production was terminated in 1954. A total of 283 mites were produced. All in all, not a bad number for an aircraft aimed at a very small niche in the market. Mites have now been around for over 70 years and thus require a labor of love and lots of TLC to keep in pristine, airworthy condition. Being fabricated from multiple materials, very thorough inspections are required to ensure the wood is not rotted, nor is any corrosion present on the metal. In 2000, one mite owner experienced the unthinkable and the whole vertical tail snapped off. Through amazing skill and loads of luck, however, the pilot somehow managed to land the aircraft and live to tail the tail. Today, the mite enjoys nearly cult status among pilots and its owners still enjoy its excellent handling, low fuel consumption, and most importantly, the fun factor. Exactly as Al Mooney intended.